So tell me, okay, now it's streaming, great. So yeah, so today it's my great pleasure to have a guest lecture from Montana State uh, University, uh, Dr. Brittany Fazy, to give us an introduction of her work of application of TDA uh, in uh, graph analysis and especially with application uh, in road network analysis. And Brittany Fazy is assistant professor at Montana State University. She earned her PhD from Duke University in 2012. Um, her research is in computation topology. She studies topological descriptors, such as persistent diagrams, for, from both theoretical and applied perspective. In addition, she studies data on graphs, directed topological spaces, and algorithm problems in computation topology. Her research is grounded in real world applications, including road network analysis and prostate cancer uh, prognosis. So without further delay, uh, let's uh, welcome Brittany to give her amazing talk for the day. Go ahead, Brittany. All right, thanks, Dave. <laughs> Can you share your screen? Is it working? Um, I will check to make sure it works. Um, Hold on. And also, Faye, I have made you a uh, host. Yeah, I see. Okay, maybe that's the reason you are not able to stream. So, okay. I'll stay until Brittany. While Brittany figured out, I can tell another story that uh, at some point, Brittany and I went to Austria. Well, we spent uh, half a year in Austria studying. And then we went on this road trip with our advisor to the forest in Austria. And uh, well, it's a good story, so maybe I should say it. So basically we decided that it's a good place for mushroom hunting, except um, <laughs> none of us uh, knows uh, what is poisonous, what is not. So we kind of pick what we think looks good. And uh, on the way back, we met uh, a hunter in the woods who don't speak English, but uh, he looked at our basket and says, gift it, and starts throwing things out. So I figured the Austrian word of giftig or giftig, whatever, may mean poisonous. So it turns out, you know, 50% of the mushroom we pick were actually really poisonous. So that was a fun memory. Um, I did not die because we met a hunter who told us some of them are not edible. And I don't know, can I say the second story happened on that trip, Brittany? Well, this is up to you. These are your students, say. Eh? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I just want to say how much fun we had at grad school other than just doing research. Um, I also managed to convince Brittany to go into a, a pond oh, where yeah. there's 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 <laughs> fish in the pond. So I said, Brittany, I think it would be an amazing idea if you can catch those fish. Um, so <laughs> she was very well persuaded <laughs> and uh, literally jumped into the pond while I was laughing on the shore. Uh, <laughs> so, fish. They're very hard to catch by hand. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, good. Um, is this working from your side? Yeah, I think you saw for a second, right? Yeah, go ahead. So I will not delay your talk and go ahead and then, you know, finish your talk and everybody feel free to ask Brittany about uh, uh, her research and so on. So, okay. All right, everyone have fun. <laughs> that was a command from Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if, could we do a quick round of introductions from your end? Um, I, just so I know kind of a little bit more about who's, joining me here today. Um, so I guess your name, and I think there's a mix of undergrads and grad students, so kind of where you are in your studies, and maybe your favorite thing that you've covered in this class. Or it can oh. be a random thing that you remember you've covered in this class, and that be your favorite. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll start. Hi, my name is Faye. Um, I'm a second year PhD student working with Bay on topological data analysis and visualization. Uh, favorite thing that's covered in this class? Mm. That's a little hard. Um. <laughs> or what you like to research, or what you research maybe too. Oh, uh, my research? Oh, right now I'm doing something about mergeable summary. So how to merge uh, topological descriptors like uh, merge trees, mostly merge trees. And then kind of merge trees right now, there's some research on how to merge them under uh, L infinity distance, and we're trying to figure out how to do it in L1 and L2. Yeah, so. Cool. Okay, should I pick the next person? Uh, yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Okay, let me pick Karthik. Hi, I'm Karthik. 
I'm a second year master's student. Uh, this is my last semester here at the university. Uh, I work on problems related to statistical shape modeling uh, most of the time. And in this class, I think the most interesting thing I found was persistent images. It's like, it felt like the most random thing to do, but it works anyway. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, let me pick Devin. Hi, I'm Devin. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student. Um, my research is in visualization. I just uh, submitted to Viz a couple weeks ago for, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. That was fun. Um, <laughs> uh, for for a, a, like a visualization design study project. So we built a visualization tool that helps our collaborators who take pictures of cells to help um, basically find which drugs are gonna be effective uh, for a particular patient's uh, like type of cancer. Yeah. Um, Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew, I'm an undergrad. And I think the coolest thing for me in this class was just learning what homology was because I took um, Uh-oh, he froze. Didn't go over homology yet, but we kind of hinted at it. We lost you a little bit, though. Your favorite thing is homology, I heard. <laughs> is, he, is Andrew frozen for you? Yes. Okay. Very <laughs> much so. <laughs> um, maybe a volunteer for the next one. <laughs> okay. Um, Anka, is he here? Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. So my name is Anka. I'm a second year uh, PhD. I uh, my research topic is computer graphics. Uh, more specifically, I do uh, mo uh, motion capture, human motion capture uh, technology. So uh, we just uh, got accepted by the SIGGRAPH conference. And so the most interesting thing we, uh, I found about this uh, class is uh, how, do you, how, how, uh, how can you merge uh, geometric information into merge trees and using merge tree interpolation to uh, actually move those informations back to your geometric shapes. So that is what I do for my final projects too. Cool, and congrats on the SIGGRAPH paper. Uh, thank you. Can you pick the next uh, person? Uh, Sunny? Hi, my name's Sunny. I'm a first year's master's student here at the U studying like data science. And uh, my research is currently in visualization and I'm working on a project right now to hopefully identify misinformation in social media. Yeah. Um, a B. Um, all right, sorry. Uh, yeah, my name is Abi. Um, I am a first year master's student uh, and I did my research in uh, performing compression on a neural uh, neural network uh, for natural language processing. And uh, I guess my favorite aspect of this class is um, uh, learning about persistent homology and also applying machine learning with uh, topological data analysis. So yeah, um, I guess I'll go with uh, Alec. Hello, I'm Alec. I'm a second year master's student. Um, I do computer graphics and visualization research uh, as it pertains to carbon sequestration, geological carbon sequestration. And I think um, this most recent project actually was super interesting in um, kind of clustering uh, images um, and then projecting, projecting them with TSNI and MDS. Um, I found that 
really interesting and pretty cool. Uh, we'll do David. Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I am doing a rotation under Bay and I am interested in things uh, mostly mostly geometric and how algebraic properties change when you put it on the computer from the normal continuous case you would see in something like Hatcher's book. Uh, and uh, yeah, so oh, and my favorite thing from this class has been utilizing computational topology for time series such as Taken's embedding. Uh, yeah, so I'll pick Tripti. You're muted. Rod, you're mute. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Tripti. I'm a first year PhD student. I'm also doing a rotation with Bay. And uh, yeah, I've not really started doing a lot of research in uh, topology as of now. Mm, but, but I would say like my most interesting, the, uh, the aspect of this class is how you can use topology with machine learning. Yeah, that really excites me how we can use topological features to in machine learning. Um, um, Michelle, are you done with who? Madison um, or Mingju? I don't know who's left. Madison, yeah, Madison can go. I think she's not. Okay, um, I'm Maddie. I'm a second year PhD student, uh, and I work on graph algorithms and um, like biological applications of graph algorithms um, using computational or uh, combinatorial techniques. Um, and for this class, I found it really interesting, just all of the applications and uses of persistent homology. Um, so I, I think it's been really interesting learning about that. Uh, so yeah, I guess who hasn't gone yet? Sing Hoon. Yeah, hi. So my name is Sang Hoon and I'm second year PhD student in mathematics department. And I'm um, I'm studying geometric group theory. And my recent research is about um, infinite graph classification and their mapping class groups. And the one thing I love, love this class is to see applicational aspect of topology because um, I've been thought about like topology as a like, pure math subject, but it was kind of amazing to see how topology can be applied in real life. Uh, so Jordan. Hi. I should be able to turn my camera on. Um, oh, there, there are two of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Other Jordan can go. Okay, fine. Um, so uh, Jordan Sathry, I'm a master's student in applied math. Uh, this is my last semester. My, my, my research project has been related to um, modeling neural activity in monkeys' brains when they're completing visual memory tests. And so uh, in this class, I have been, my, my final project, I am, I'm, it's related to my master's project. And so I'm trying to build a classifier that, that classifies the signal into which the, the, the stimuli of which they're a response to. So I'm, I'm using uh, spike count vectors and uh, I'm gonna do a sliding window uh, time embedding of those vectors and then uh, com compute the persistent image from it and use that as a uh, an input into like a support vector classifier. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess uh, other Jordan can go now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I'm Jordan Washington. I'm a first year master's student in um, <laughs> graphics that's the first word graphics and visualization track in um computer science so <clears throat> i think you know one of the most interesting and exciting things about topology is um and specifically the methods 
in machine learning is, is kind of that it's a new take on something that a lot of energy is being, being put into around classification and, um, you know, dimensionality methods. And I really look forward to, um, I even talked with my friend, there was a lecture where we went over, I guess, uh, protein docking. And I actually have a friend who works for a startup in um, Boston that <clears throat> specializes in trying out different combinations of um, molecules for uh, pharmaceutical development. And he was like, oh, I haven't even thought of that. Like, uh, that may be something interesting that we could look into. So it's definitely kind of on the cutting edge. And so that's really exciting. Um, and then I don't know who else hasn't gone. So there's Mitchell and Ming Duo. Pick one. Uh, Mitchell. Uh, hey, uh, I'm Mitchell. Uh, I'm a master's student. Um, I don't have an advisor yet, um, but uh, for this class, I actually really liked learning about uh, persistent homology because um, I'd, I'd never heard of that algorithm before. So that was just a kind of new and exciting thing. Um, yeah, um, I think uh, Ming, Ming Zhu is the only one left. Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Minja. I'm a first year PhD student um, advised by uh, Bay. Yeah, my um, recent research is about uh, sketching topological descriptors such as mirror trees, uh, Morris graphs, Morris smell complexes, um, and probably we will further extend it to other things. And we are interested in some applications of such projects. Yeah, uh, I did not get in touch with topo topology after, like, until I get here. Like, it was really a good experience of learning those topology and combine them with all my previous knowledge of algorithms, machine learning strategies, etc. Yeah, I really have fun here. Super. Yeah. All right, well. Yeah, I appreciate you all sharing that information with me um, because it helps me know who I'm talking to. Um, what I'm going to do, so um, in my classes when I teach virtually, I use a tool called Miro. So I've created one, but I'll also share my screen so you don't have to go to it if you don't want to. Um, let's see, let me share from here. Yeah, um, and yeah, so um, maybe first some <laughs> beginning of the thing announcements. Um, so the work I'll talk about today is mostly um, in collaboration with Micah Buchan, and Aaron Chambers, um, Fang, 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 um, Ellen Gasper, Elizabeth Munch, and Carola Wink. Um, and yeah, so of course you have to think NSF, there's three grants um, that are related to this work. Um, and I put my contact information here so you can always reach out to me if you have questions relating to it or um, yeah, went into a chat about anything. Um, and then I don't know if you guys know about this, but there's a, what, what is a women in computational topology listserv um, and to join it, you just send a blank email to wincomtop plus subscribe at googlegroups.com. Um, and it's actually become like a go-to place for <laughs> advertising lots of things in the computational topology community. So um, yeah, so if you're in the uh, TDA, coming into TDA and something related to TDA or computational topology, um, I encourage you to join. Um, yeah. So and then we'll go over here where the boards will be. Um, and if you have questions, you, you will be able to write on this yourself. I'll probably lock it afterwards just so that we don't get, you know, um, people drawing inappropriate things on it afterwards. But um, uh, yeah, so, but you, it will be available to you if you wanted to come back to open business. So I think first I'll kind of give you like a, a kind of list of several projects that I'm kind of working on um, or have worked on too. Um, one of them, um, yeah, and I think I can just add a picture, my device. Um, 
Okay. <laughs> um, is with uh, prostate cancer. So um, when pathologists get, oh, that's my notes. So we'll delete this. We deleted the wrong thing. Where did it go? Um, Gleason. Oh, okay. I'm sharing this, so I'll just share it from here then. Um, so the Gleason grade is, so when you have a prostate cancer histology slide, um, so it's from like a biopsy or, or a prostatectomy, um, the pathologist kind of grades it based on like how bad it looks, right? Where this one is kind of not cancerous, five is, you know, very dangerous territory. Most of them will be coming out in threes and fours. Um, and it gives it, there's, it's various ways in which this has um, changed or I guess throughout the years, um, especially in the 2000s. Um, but essentially they're looking to see what does it, what does this look like, right? Um, and you can see like the, when the prostate is, a, um, you can think of it like a bunch of tubes. And when you cr get cross functions, you get circles, right? So you're, Biopsies are um, the 2D ones are going to be circles. Um, we're working on some 3D things now too, but um, no one really understands what the 3D is. Um, and so the idea here is that topology can help a lot. So um, we we've been looking at this um, both with getting so these the circles are kind of defined by the nuclei. So um, you can segment out the nuclei, then you have a point cloud and do maybe a distance function to that point cloud, like your rips or your check filtrations. Um, where you can do distance to a measure or something, um, or you can take the biopsy slide itself. And these are kind of what biopsies look like here. Um, maybe this is not too big, so. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you can, you can um, look at those images too. And so we've um, looked at these in instance of, um, can we do classification? Like what, um, trying to distinguish you know, is this dangerously cancerous or is it slow growing? Because um, most prostate cancers are going to be slow growing and benign um, and won't really affect the patient until well after they've passed away. So um, the other thing is, which is kind of like a, um, I think I can just, I'm going to just pop this in here. Let's see if that works. Um, yeah, so with one of my collaborators, who's uh, Jesse Zizbeski, he who's now at, um, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, we look at the data from astronomy. So this here is an example of the cosmic web. So um, each kind of point in here is, is a galaxy, right? And so there's clusters of galaxies that are kind of like vertices. So you see the dark, the bright yellow areas and in between them are filaments. Those are kind of like edges. Um, and there's actually sheets too, um, 2D sheets. So they, then they form out voids. Um, kind of looks like a Voronoi diagram in 3D. Um, if you kind of think about these sheets and, and what the void space is. Um, and yeah, so we're kind of looking, we're looking at this. And um, so we have one um, project going, which she started when we were, at, we started when she was at Yale. Um, and so we're, we're running some things now, but um, looking at um, cold dark matter versus warm dark matter simulations and doing hypothesis tests with um, topological test statistics. Um, and yeah, and then also with that, um, we look at another current project that we have going on right now that has to do with um, detecting quasi periodic sig signals. So we are using um, toxins embeddings there, and that's actually a project with, with Bay as well. Um, but um, yeah, so there's lots of different things. Um, but today, what I'm going to look at um, is um, embedded and immersed graphs. Um, now, <laughs> um, some of you are doing things in graphs. Um, some of you are. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what you've covered so far here to you, but I'm, we're going to focus on comparisons actually. Okay. Um, and one thing that you might um, notice though, is that uh, 
when you think about graph comparison, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is probably uh, like subgraph isomorphism, right? Um, which is an NP complete problem. Um, and so for, so for that reason, um, like direct graph comparisons are usually kind of maybe avoided or um, thought to be hard problems, right? But um, you can also do graph isomorphism, right? So in a graph isomorphism is where we're looking for your vert vertex to vertex. Um, you, you want to find a bijection between the vertices, a bijection between the edges, such that all of the pairing information is preserved. Um, and so, and the subgraph is to do this for a subgraph, right? And it turns out that if we um, look at our um, embedded graphs and particular um, planar graphs, um, that this can be done in polynomial time um, for planar graphs. Oops. Sometimes my pen doesn't work well. Oh. Okay, so there's hope, right? Um, however, um, the problem is that does that really get us like what we want, right? Because most of our graphs are actually embedded or in a different space. Is that useful? Useful for embedded graphs. Right, um, because we need to use the embedding information and um, graph isomorphism is not using the information, right? So we want to use, use the embedding information. Okay, so let me kind of step back and kind of give some definitions. So you kind of, we, we're all on the same page about what these embedded versus immersed graphs are. Um, and, um, so, um, and I'm gonna do this actually more than just for the plane. So let's start with um, a metric space. And later we're gonna have it be a measure metric space, but be a metric space. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, M is some set. Uh, delta is some distance function. And we topologize using open balls. Okay, so this is a this is a um, a metric topology, um, and um, let's talk about curves first because those are a little bit easier than graphs. <laughs> so for curves, um, a curve is simply is going to be a function that's going to go from the unit interval to our space m, um, and we're going to say that delta. Um, is equivalent to delta prime if there exists a reparameterization. So we'll call it um, alpha from 0, 1 to 0, 1. Um, orient, we'll call it orientation preserving. Um, well, it's a homeomorphism, yeah. So you know. Continuous too. Okay, so by orientation preserving, I mean zero gets sent to zero, one gets sent to one, and then in between gets sent to itself. Um, now, homeomorphism, right, this is a continuous bijection between these two spaces, right? Um, and so we Brittany, want this. Yeah. Sorry, you, I think you need to move it up a little bit so the oh. shared screen people can see. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm looking at my iPad, so <laughs> um, yeah. 
um, such that gamma is equal to um, gamma prime composed with alpha. Okay, so we'll say that these two are equivalent. Um, and in particular, we'll call this equivalent up to homeo or up to reparameterization. Okay, um, and um, notice that we can also define length in here. Um, so, note. We can define lengths, length of a gamma. Um, and this is going to be, um, yeah, I'll give the definition, but then there's going to be a, another thing I'm going to have to define after it. It's going to be the limit um, of inscribed polygons in gamma as the mesh of the polygon goes to zero of the sum of p of i comma p of the distance between p of i and i um, and so let me explain what i mean by this so here is gamma i'll kind of do this by pictures gamma so this is gamma of zero that one's gamma of one right and if i have an inscribed polygon i'm going to choose a bunch of time steps and be in here so this is p of 0, p of 1, p of 2, p of 3, p of 4, p of 5. And we're going to um, connect them. So it's kind of, this is what's called an inscribed, um, inscribed polygon. Right? And um, if we look at the parameterization space, so we had gamma was going from the unit interval from zero to one to whatever our metric space is, right? And then P is going to take um, T zero is equal to zero less than T one less than da, 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 less than t, we'll call it n, which is equal to one. Um, and the mesh of p is going to be the max of ti minus ti plus one, where the i is defined accordingly. So it's going to be, um, you know, as we get closer and closer, right, um, so we, fit, we have our fixed parameterization and um, we kind of refine our um, polygon inscribed. Um, so that's how we define the length um, of, a, of a path. And we say that gamma is rectifiable if, um, I guess it's definition, so we can say if and only if um, length of gamma is strict is is finite so so that right down that's less than it. Okay. Right. I, I guess it's nice to tie into some applications here um so you can i think you might have your own application in mind um some of the things that i think about when i think about curves embedded in spaces um first is gps trajectories um because i've done some work with those um those are kind of messy things <laughs> Um, and so usually these are going to be in R2. Um, but really, you know, note that we're not really working in um, R2. Um, should be um, S2 or R3, right? So we, um, if we're on the surface of the sphere, S2, um, we're already kind of out of Euclidean. Um, space and I guess the things that you've also worked on were protein chains. I've never worked on those, but I've seen work in it. Um, yeah, and there's lots of other um, things that you can be thinking about too. So these would probably be in R3. Um, there's time series. 
which I guess DPS trajectories are kind of like a time series, um, maybe spatial, <laughs> spatial time series. Um, yeah, so let's take some of those notions of what's going on with um, with embedded graphs, uh, with, with embedded curves, uh, or yeah, so these are curves. Um, and let's talk about, let's put this into the space of graphs. Oh, okay, so, um, so let's say, what do I want? Um, yeah, let's put this right here. Okay, so we kind of start with an abstract graph. Right. And so what this is what is this? But a graph is um, in case I need the subscript later, I'll just call it VG and EG. Right. Um, so it's a set of vertices and a set of edges. Um, now we can think of the top, the graph as a topological space. Um, as a topo space. Right. Um, each edge is a copy of the unit interval, say, which can be a subset of R1. Right. And so we take the subspace topology um, on the unit edge. Um, and then connecting at vertices, um, take the quotient space topology. Okay. Um, so, um, and that's the topology we're going to use. Um, so I can say, nope, there's an other topology, an alternate topology. is the Alexandrov topology, which is more common when you're looking with some palatial complexes, but, um, or CW complexes. The so maybe I'll just give a quick example here. Um, right. Um, in this graph, right, at any time this, ver because this vertex is three edges coming together, Right? And any time of, and, and we had for each edge is a copy of the unit interval. And every time, since we're using subspace topology on that, so every time this vertex comes, I have any open interval has to include some open interval around each of the edges. So that, that's one open set. We can have open sets be subsets of an edge. Um, they can go through one of the vertices, right? Um, so this is kind of what we're thinking about here. Um, they can. Yeah, it could be the whole graph or so forth. Now with the Alexandrov topology, maybe this one in green, every time we take the edge, we have to, of the vertex, we have to take all of the edges that it's in. Um, so must take all edges in the open set whenever we take a vertex. Okay, so for that reason, it's also called like the upset topology. So every time you take, um, you think of these as partially ordered sets by containment, and every time you take one of the sets, like a vertex is a single set, right? You take all of the sets um, that it's a subset of. And yeah, um, but yeah, so those are just kind of two different topologies. We'll work with the, the first one. Um, because it's convenient for certain things I'll do, I, I, I maybe not do today, but um, work in general. Um, but I think this is kind of um, interesting that as a, you know, when you have the, the lens of topology to view things, like all of a sudden everything becomes topological spaces and then um, we can define like continuous maps from them and so forth um, using the topological notion of continuity. Right? And so that's what we'll do. So if I take um, my space M, right? Remember, it's a measure matrix space. So we have some 
do, ooh, we'll call it M maybe, a map going from um, G to M. And so, and then uh, maybe I put a note over here, X in G might be, um, is either a vertex or a point internal to an edge. Okay. Um, and so we take G to M. Um, and we want it to be continuous. Right. And so oops, let's move this down. Now we call this an embedding. If G is homeomorphic to M of G, um, and G is homeo, or maybe I'll, maybe I'll even make this stronger. Um, M is a homeomorphism onto its image. Okay, um, so as a result, G is homeomorphic to M of G, which is a weaker statement. They're just, the safety things are homeomorphic. We don't know what the map is to. Um, now, if it's an immersion, it's only locally um, a homeomorphism. So um, M is locally a homeomorphism. Okay, so what does that mean, right? Well, that means that um, for every point in G, um, there exists, we'll call it a radius R, um, such that for all balls in G centered at X with radius R, um, we put for all R less than or equal to capital R. Um, and maybe I give this a name so that I don't have to rename it. And then, yeah. I can define this by R is less than R, X. Oh, we had X and G. Yeah, okay, sorry. B um, is homeomorphic um, I want to say this right <laughs> M when restricted to B is an embedding. Okay, so let me draw a picture. So if this is my very exciting graph, G, right? Three vertices, two edges. Um, and then if I wanna go into M, right? Well, I can do many things. Um, I could put it like that, right? That's an embedding and an isomorphism, um, but if I were to look at this, say, this is an isomorphism, but not an embedding. Okay, but you might say, what about that intersection point that I've created? That's not a homeomorphism, right? Well, it's just about the localness, but it's only localness in G. So if I were to take a neighborhood here, right, and call that my B, right? So here's my X, there's a small enough neighborhood that it, its image is over here, right? Now I'm ignoring everything else in the graph. So that now is a homeomorphism. Um, Could you scroll down a little bit, please? Oh, yeah. Yep. So then I was saying that 
over here, we have, um, yeah, for every small enough neighborhood on the left, you map it over and it's homeomorphic forms for its image. Um, so we have to kind of cut that out, cut out the rest of the stuff going on. And that'll be a theme that we see um, is cutting out the rest of the stuff. So let me give this a, space, a name and I'll say that G, um, yeah, we'll just use G sub M is the set of all graphs immersed in M. So um, if I have an element of um, the space, I would write that there's going to be a pair. Um, right? Is we have to have a, an under, oops, that should be a G. <laughs> right? There's going to be a pair, which is the graph um, and its immersion. A graph and immersion. Okay. And um, one of the questions that I, that we have, I'll go to this next board. Yeah, so you'll see here, we have the graph and the image. Okay. <laughs> My trackpad here, so it's a little funny. Okay. Um, so and one of our questions that we'll talk about this space, um, or maybe even before thinking about it as a space, is you know, how do I compare to embedded or immersed graphs, right? Um, and we'll kind of talk about maybe mostly immersed. Um, two immersed graphs. Okay, and um, when you want to answer this question, um, so there's, I guess, research, right, in transportation sciences that might be interested in this, um, which is kind of where we um, come from. And so in road network analysis, I'll say, many of the distances are actually heuristics. Um, and so, you know, as a kind of topologist coming at this question, there's an opportunity to say, like, can we make this um, more meaningful, right? Um, and so we, we want some theory to back it up, maybe. <laughs> and I'll put meaningful theory. Um, to back up our distances. Distance. And when I teach a, a computational topology class here um, every other spring, and when I teach it, there's also a course project. It seems like you guys have too. And I um, kind of warn the students, right, if you're analyzing your own data or something like that, um, many of the much of your research is going to be spent on um, trying to figure out what is the best distance to use in this case, right? Because there's often lots of choices. Um, but the question is, which one is best, right? Um, and so meaningful, we'll come back to that, right? Um, but what are some goals, maybe? Um, some objectives for a distance. Okay, well, one, we like metrics, right? Um, I'll just say we like them. <laughs> right? that we can do many things with metric. Um, it, if it's not a metric, right? um, for example, if you don't have the separability, then you're defining a distance essentially on equivalence classes of your domain, of whatever you're looking at. Um, which is sometimes, which is usually fine too, but um, you might not have the triangle inequality, right? These are things that um, always good to have. 
Um, but more strongly, we might want like an inner product space. Um, and that's because, um, let's say here, that it behaves like Euclidean space. Let me see if I like quote that part, not Euclidean space. <laughs> So in other words, many of the things that we know how to do, like look at angles and so forth, um, in Euclidean space, we can do in inner product spaces. Um, and so, um, which then opens up like um, now different machine learning and different statistical techniques, which you guys have all mentioned, uh, or most of you in <laughs> what you're talking about and what you're working on. Um, they do require some assumptions on distances that you're using. Um, you know, at the very least, it usually requires a metric um, and often requires um, stronger assumptions, um, such as inner product spaces or Hilbert spaces, um, which are, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> inner, Hilbert spaces are inner product spaces. Um, now, um, today, I'm just going to focus on metric, um, just to pick one to be. And what I'm going to do is um, look at what we can define. Um, so, so what distances can we define on the space of graphs immersed in a, a metric space? And is it a metric? Um, and that's kind of one of the, the keys that we're looking at here, right? Um, and the first, first pass is something called the Hausdorff distance. Okay. Now, if I... Um, yeah, so maybe we just define this. <laughs> it, the distance in the house, house dwarf distance is going to go from GM plus GM to R, and it's going to take two graphs, we call them G and H, and maybe they need their, yeah, you know what, I will make this slightly easier for myself so I can just say, ah, what did I do? There we go. Um, I'll just say that you know, we might, might just butcher it a little bit and just refer to the pair as G sum just to make it shorter here. Um, but we always know that there's that map um, and this is going to get mapped to, so now we have to think about the, the metric space. And I think I use delta for M. Um, let's go back. Um, yes. Okay. Um, and so we're going to take look over all points in G. All points in G. And we're going to find its closest partner in H. H and H. Um, and then we're going to look at their distance in their map. So we have M sub G of G and m sub h of h. And so, this is the directed Hausdorff distance. Uh -huh. And then the Hausdorff distance is defined to be GM plus GM 
to R, um, which is going to take GH to the max of the directed ones. So we're going to have direction Hausdorff from G to H and the directed Hausdorff from H to G. Okay. And this does not take the structure of, um, of the graphs into play, right? It just says, it thinks about them as sets and each point is kind of an isolated point. Um, and so, um, yeah, so maybe I'll put properties <laughs> here, um, is that um, now on the space of immersed graphs, as I said, that so we have DH is a pseudometric, so it's not quite a metric. And the one thing it's not, it's not separable. Um, I'll show you that in a second. Um, but when restricted to embedded graphs, DH is a metric. Okay. And this not separability comes exactly from um, here's my here's a graph G and here's a graph H. And when I draw H, you might see where this is going. Um, and then they both can embed into M as the same. Um, so maybe I'll draw the vertices of G of H in one color and in G in another color so you can kind of see that. Let me make sure you can see that. Right, so that's exactly why it's not separable. Um, and yeah, so, but yeah, as usual with Hausdorff, the structure is not taken into account. Um, and even for, um, not preferred even for graphs, right? So not preferred even for graphs. And the standard picture we think about is um, Suppose I have something going like this, and then I have another kind of a spirally thing on top of it. Right? You can think that I can make the spiral tight enough and the back and forth tight enough that they could be super close, um, but they're not the same, right? Um, they're doing a different pattern. Um, and if you can think about maybe if these are row networks, driving on these two networks are going to be much different, right? Um, and um, so, the idea is we really want to talk about the structure, right? Um, for road networks, we care about um, how can we get from point A to point B. Um, and I'm going to kind of skip over using the Frechet distance in order to kind of focus on the, the local persistent homology difference. Um, but maybe I say, uh, um, note, and try Frechet distance. Right. Um, and if, I'm not sure if you know the first shade distance is called the dog leash distance. Um, but essentially, we're going to have a homeomorphism between two graphs. And so you can generalize that the graphs and have a homeomorphism between two graphs, such that a point in this image are going to be um, at the same spot. Oh, I've got a question. How the equivalence between GM and MH? is defined in G sub M. Uh, so if I were to, um, this is um, 
why it's not separable. Okay, and so this is that saying that the distance at the Hausdorff between G and it's this particular thing. I'm not sure if this is answering your question. Um, Mg is equal to zero. Okay, um, and one way um, that and maybe I can mention here. Um, uh, nope. One way to force separability is to define equivalence classes um, that X is equal to all G and G such that, oh, sorry. G and ah, our graph space, I'm, I almost have a graph space there, <laughs> graph space of G such that the distance between X and G is zero. Um, and so if we define equivalence classes this way, um, then we can say the distance between the equivalence class for G and the equivalence class for H um, is equal to, um, we want to do the minimum Um, between these two equivalence classes is going to be the minimum over, uh, we'll call it all G prime in the equivalence class for G, H prime in the equivalence class for H of D of G, the house of distance between G prime and H prime. Um, now this, for our particular setting here, then they would actually, all, that it, we could still, we could just use G and H um, for our stand-ins, um, but more generally, you might need to go through the equivalence class. Um, so, does that answer the question of how the equivalence classes are defined there? I don't see any more writing on the wall here. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe I'll now kind of quickly kind of go into, we'll start on the next board. Um, and I'm not sure, have you covered local persistence at all, or local homology? No. Okay. I think so, yeah. So, local persistent homology. Um, and the idea is, um, so choose, um, we'll say, um, we'll say a closed, I mean, I always use open ball, open ball in M, a closed open ball, um, a closed ball in M. And I'm gonna throw some pictures in here too, because this is oh. what happened to my pictures. Um. And so, whoa, <laughs> um, we'll just put this up here then. <laughs> um, and so the idea is that we're, um, we're gonna kind of cut, clip the graph to that ball. And then I'm gonna look at the distance function to the graph, um, restrict it to that ball, but relative to the boundary of the ball. Um, and so 
to look at um, so we'll define LPH from GM cross GM to R, which takes a graph H and a graph G and maps it to. So um, we're going to integrate over all closed balls. And we're going to compute for H and G, we're going to compute the um, the diagram of, we'll call it G, restricted to this ball. Um, so here's G. This is G. This is G epsilon, right? Um, this is G two epsilon, say, right? So um, we're thickening G. Um, and we're taking it down here is look at the homology. Um, of the restriction to this ball relative to the boundary. So the relative, so relative homology, right? You have your space and you have a subset of the space. So we have the ball and the subset is the boundary. And then we say all of a sudden that everything on the boundary is equivalent. Um, and when I do this, oops, this kind of got moved, but um, that's okay. Right. What are the actual topological spaces that I have here? So if I put everything in the same thing, so I have my center vertex. And then I I'll call this V, right? We have V. Um, and then we have three, and this is the boundary of the ball is now one point, and we have three things going to it, right? So we have maybe if we want to count one connected component and two loops. Yep. So um, now if I thicken it, right, I'm still going to have the same thing. So I can kind of think, oh, I kind of already drew the last one thickened. But I kind of just have a thickened version of this. Right? Um, and then one of the loops disappears. Right, so then here I have essentially just one loop left. And that loop. Um, is equivalent to um, circle this to say that these two are identified as f over there. So there's one loop. Um, and so we're looking at these relative homology. This is kind of getting at what's going on deep down. Um, and we're going to look at the same diagram for h. Um, Choose your favorite distance between the two. So maybe um, maybe the bottleneck distance between them. Um, and, and maybe multiply by some weight function. Um, omega is some weight function. And yeah, I know we're out of time here, but the idea is that um, if omega, I'll just say, is nice, <laughs> then um, DLPH is a metric um, on embedded graphs. OK, and we'll have the same. Um, going to be a, a pseudo metric otherwise. Uh, so on the space of uh, immersed grass. Um, uh, 
on immerse graphs. And one of the things that we like about this is that um, if I have kind of a blip in my data, right, um, I'm thickening things. So this will get filled in. Which means that in a thicker version of it, oops, maybe I'll just use the highlighter here. Uh, oh, that's not, there we go. But in a thicker version of it, then um, I can think about the path that there's a path in there, right? Um, and so we can really think about this local persistent homology because it is looking at these loops are kind of equivalent to looking at paths. Um, it's a little less sensitive than the Frechet distance, which if there's a blip in it, we can't really use the, the Frechet, Frechet distance. Um, and the other cool thing, which um, if you work with domain experts on anything, um, oops, I don't know what that was, we'll delete it. Um, Um, yeah, if you work with domain experts, um, they often, there we go, really like flashy pictures. Um, and if we can visualize the distance, which did I just add it in, um, which we can, uh, maybe I'll share my screen, the other version of it. I don't know why it's not adding in. Um, then there's, uh, we have this flashy picture that when we presented this at um, what's called ACM6 Spatial, um, they, the people who are working in industry really liked it um, because so there are two graphs here and I just color coded one of the graphs with the distance. Um, and of course, where their intersection behavior looked differently, it's, it's red um, and yellow where they're most, uh, brighter yellow where they're most similar. Um, so, um, Okay, um, yeah, so that's kind of um, some view of how to use <laughs> TDA and um, persistence with graph comparison, um, mostly motivated by road network analysis. So I know we're out of time, but if you have questions, I'll be available here. Can you talk a little bit more about the last graph that you shared? What, um, like what, do you mean? Yeah. Um, what are you trying to do with that, I guess? Yeah, so yeah, it stopped me from sharing. I don't know if my windows are closing. Maybe I'm closing them. <laughs> um, yeah, so here, um, so there's two graphs that you're seeing. Um, there's one that's gray and kind of thicker, and then there's one that's colored and, and in front. Um, and I, we use the per, local persistent homology distance, but we kind of just fixed a radius of balls, um, which was, I think the radius was about, uh, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think what the radius was about this, uh, half the length of this edge right here. I have one picture with, the ball overlaid on it, but I can do it. And so for the center of each ball that we used, um, the we kind of have one pixel or it's, it's kind of like really pixelated, but one square box, right? And um, the center of the ball is color coded. Um, and so that's how we drew the second graph here. So it's kind of like a, I think the people in visualization are probably cringing, but, <laughs> um, we could visualize the dis distances between them just by looking at um, the distance restricted to balls centered on one of the graphs. Um, and so when we're kind of up here in this region, um, they're very similar. Um, and that's kind of indicated by this yellow and orangey color. Um, and then they're least similar where their intersection behaviors are much different, right? Um, and that's kind of, but that's exactly where this red um, colors are coming from. Um, so the more different they are, the, the redder it is. 
That's Correct. kind of the point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's where, especially a lot of people in this class with the, the you know the visualization expertise that you have at Utah State, um, I think talking with experts, whatever domain you're talking in, having something that's visual to share with them is so important. Um, and it's part of the exciting part of, I think, computational topology is that it's very related to geometry. There's shapes there. Um, and these things, um, people can have an intuition and can learn what they need. Um, but it's like this communication thing too, which is, um, yeah, I like it. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone else? No? And, okay. and which, which just, you said you could use bottleneck distance. What distance did you end up using? I think for that, we just used the bottleneck distance. Um, I, I did, uh, for that example, yeah, it, it works um, as long as the distance between persistence diagrams is a metric, um, it'll work there, yeah. Um, and for the whole distance between the two graphs, that integral I said to, to be a metric, um, you need um, the the weight function has to behave nicely, and that like um, the weights um, have yeah as you go to as you get um, to smaller balls, they have to um, not they can't vanish. Um, cause otherwise you could have small differences that kind of get overlooked. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I guess that would be the end of our lecture from our, uh, guest speaker. Thank you so much. That was, that was very nice to see, you know, there are so many things that we can do with computational topology. Um, yeah, there are people clapping.